Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with Clone Wars Season 7, Episode 2, A Distant Echo. This is Part 2 of the Echo arc, I suppose we're going to call this, where uh, we're trying to fight the Separatists, kill Trench, kill the clone, kill the droids, kill the Jedi. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I want to mention, yeah, this is the Bad Batch arc. Um, <laughs> I mean, actually, StarCraft music could fit Elden Ring. A couple zones, right? Get some Zerg music going on. Get down to the swamp. The search for truth begins with belief. I just realized, I don't I don't actually remember if I talked about this during the Midnight Nation series, but I just realized why I like these quotes at the beginning of these episodes so much. Something I hate, something I push against, something I constantly am bashing uh, when it comes to everything, when it comes to fiction especially though, is there's this thing where someone else did X and that was successful and that worked. So I'm going to do X too and not think about how or why or what or uh, anything whatsoever, right? Instead, I'm just going to repeat it. I actually have a term for that. I call it bullet point syndrome, where we look at the surface level comparison and don't understand how or why what they did worked. These quotes at the beginning of these are actually the opposite of that because they're very Star Wars, if you think about it. One of the most iconic things about Star Wars, other than its music, is that opening title crawl, right? That nice, big, angular thing showcasing, you know, le 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 leading into a particular episode. These quotes, yeah, exactly, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. These quotes are the show's way of adapting that concept, that icon iconography, into a way that fits the show. Each quote having some relevance and significance to the episode in question. The search for truth begins with belief. And that's true. Rex absolutely believed that um, that Deco was there. He didn't know it. He didn't understand it. But he believed it. And thus he could actually figure out what the hell is going on. Um, it really does, Rex. I'm actually going to talk about iconography and themes again in a minute here. So, big big thumb, thumb plus, right? Like, they're just... I'm, I'm with it. I'm with it. I like... I like the usage of the thing. This is, in many ways, the exact opposite of what we were talking about last time with the member berries concept. Because one of the biggest problems with member berries, aka fan service done badly, is it's just bullet pointed, right? Like, oh yeah, you liked such and such from the other film or from the other game or from the other book or from the other show. So here it is again without any thought or reason put into how it should be here, how it should adapt to this work, to this particular bit of fiction. I, I, I could name a bunch of examples, but just to keep it in the Star Wars, all I'm going to say is, episode 9. Just, just the whole film. Just the whole film. Really. <laughs> just, yeah, that's probably the starkest example of, Huh? when it comes to member berries in Star Wars. At least in the stuff I've seen. Remember, I actually haven't uh, personally seen a lot of Star Wars media. In fact, I thought about something which I've been sitting on until Mr. Red shows up, because I think he'll be amused by it. But anyways, so, speaking of the Clone Wars, one other little tidbit I like that they do periodically, and this, this is going to tie into it at a later point, is they like to add just a little bit of variance to things. How many of you noticed in the previous episode that a lot of the fauna, or no, wrong word, a lot of the flora, excuse me, on the planet they were fighting on is crystalline or petrified. Like, when you take a chunk out of the tree trunk, it actually goes sing, like with a much higher pitched thing. Like, they just took a chunk out of concrete or something like that. Um, and when we see the droid droid uh, walkers smashing through, you can hear it crinkling like glass. Minor touches like that are honestly something I think Star Wars lives and breathes on. And I mean that because, and again, this goes all the way back to A New Hope. One of the things that distinguished A New Hope from the ridiculous majority of science fiction before it is that there were certain portions of, of the film that felt alien, for lack of a better way to put it. They felt wild or fantastical or just different. Sure, there's a band over there playing in the corner, but there's... God, have you seen the, the people in the bar? Stuff like that, that juxtaposition, and I'll talk about that again in a second here. It's very Star Wars, so I like those little touches. Moving on. So, Anakin has to go do that thing, and Rex is just like, 
And Anakin's like, mm -hmm, and, 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 and I love Hunter's just like, you go do whatever. I don't even care. This, oh my God. I actually don't remember if this was before in Clone Wars. Uh, I legitimately don't remember. But this, this is such a great scene. In this one scene, Anakin and Padme have more chemistry and dynamic than in three films combined. And I stand by that sentence. Keeping in mind, I do like a couple of individual scenes across the, the, the films. This still does some great stuff with them. It's the, the dynamic between Anakin and Padme is great. And it's also a character bit for Rex. How many people know about Anakin and Padme? Now, obviously, Palpatine does because he's friggity Palpatine. But now we know, and again, I can't remember if they showed this before, that Rex is in on it too. And, and if obviously, Obi-Wan knows, too. <laughs> so, obviously, Obi-Wan knows. But the... Yeah, Obi-Wan Obi probably deduced. But Rex is straight up in on it. Just actually in on it. Where does Anakin keep, Anakin keep the private communicator to talk with his wife? In Rex's helmet. Think about that for a second. Really think about that for a second. That says so much about Anakin and Rex, Rex's relationship right there. And I, I love that. And they don't even call it out. Just like the wonderful stuff over in Arcane, they don't need to treat us like we're an idiot. We can figure out, we can deduce, based on what they're showing, the significance of these events. Um, yeah, Rex is a bro, right? God, I love Rex so much. Rex is a bro. That's awesome. Um, so then we have a bit of a lighthearted comedy scene uh, going on here. Where, you know, Rex, I mean, Rex is a lot of things. He's a bro, you know, he's a good general, he's a good fighter, he cares about his people. Not a very good liar. Obi-Wan comes up, and at first, I was actually about to bash Obi-Wan for be, for not immediately picking up on the extremely obvious lies that Rex was telling until I realized, and again, the episode calls this out a little bit, Obi-Wan knows, knows, that Anakin is in there talking to Padme. Yeah, tell Padme I said hi. And it's just like... Yeah, he's just, he's just playing with him. He's just playing with him. I do find myself wondering. I feel like... I want to touch, us, uh, touch on this in Our Wars. I feel like Obi-Wan and Anakin's relationship needed to be even better fleshed out than it already is. And they needed to touch on these kind of little moments like this. And uh, the connection between him and Padme and Anakin, especially given where we're taking Padme. No spoilers. Getting off topic. I also wanted to mention, uh, I like, th there's other little touches here. Obviously, and Nerez has already pointed this out, obviously uh, Padme is starting to show. In other words, she is pregnant, and it's starting to be visible. And it's not super obvious until they do a really close-up sideways shot to specifically show her in frame so you can see that. And it makes perfect sense why Anakin would not notice that, especially given he's got so much else on his mind. And he is, and, and literally, if you take into account the angle of how he's looking down at her since he is taller than her looking at the hologram. So it makes sense that he has not noticed this. Remember, he doesn't find out until episode three when he comes back from the sieges they're currently in the middle of. Um, so... Okay, yeah, no, that's good. That's more little good detail stuff. But I also love how there's one other little detail, and this is the last little detail I'll point out here, I swear. Anakin, you know, Rex is like, bang, bang, because it's Obi-Wan, and Anakin's like, ugh. But then Padme distracts him, and at first I was a little bit irritated, just, just a little, because you'd think if Anakin's trying to keep this quiet, he would be a little bit more alarmed that Obi-Wan's coming. But knowing that it's just Obi-Wan, Padme and Anakin both continue their conversation. Probably because they either openly or tacitly admit that Obi-Wan knows and they trust him. So she feels like the conversation she's having with him is sufficiently important to go ahead and keep having rather than immediately cutting it off on verge of being discovered. If that was Mace Windu, they probably would have just been like, and that's the end of the call. Or if that was Yoda, or if that was uh, Kiari Mundi. But it's Obi-Wan. So it's not the end of the world if he walks in, right? So they keep having their conversation. And Padme, 
accurately and immediately cuts to the heart of the matter that Anakin is worried about Rex and knows that Rex and him, well, are really, really close, so you got to have his back on this one. And the episode arc so far continues to be about Rex. Uh, don't make a mistake, but the Bad Batch are awesome, but Rex is still taking the forefront when it comes to characterization. So they go off on their mission. Whoosh. And in the background, Wrecker is benching a gonk one-handed. That probably doesn't sound impressive. How many of you have ever done any kind of weightlifting before in your life? Oh yeah, also, gonk. So, I bring this up because, let's say you're laying back at, on, a, on a bench, and you're going to lift something, and you do this, right? The number of muscles and bones and tendons helping to support this is actually more than you think. Obviously, this is primarily going to be hitting uh, whatever this... I, I don't remember the name of it. It's this muscle right here and this muscle right here. But there's still quite a few muscles that are going into this, right? So this isn't as hard as you'd think, relatively speaking. I'm not trying to sound diminishing or insulting. I'm just saying a lot of people, when they think about benching, they think about this. It's the same thing with a push-up. You ever done a push-up? Doing a push-up isn't really all that hard. Now do a one-armed push-up. You'd think it would just be twice as hard, and you would be extremely wrong. Doing that kind of a thing with just one arm is not only much, much harder on all those same joints, and muscles and all that, but that, oh, that is way, 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 way harder. And then we do the closed fist push up, and you get the point. There's all sorts of ways to make it like exponentially harder rather than just multiplicatively harder. So forgive me for geeking out a little bit, but Wrecker just back there doing this is insane. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure Wookiees are looking at Wrecker being like, damn, dude. And yeah, as Hazardous has pointed out twice, that was his working weight, not his max weight. He wasn't really straining himself to do that. Poor Gonks. We've actually been talking lately in our wars about um, the difference between bots and droids and how much we're going to lean into that when it comes to our wars. It's a whole topic. We haven't, we haven't concluded it yet. But I look at Gonks and I think, yeah, that probably doesn't need to be a fully sentient sapient being. Anyways. So... They go, they crack, they land, there's the people, they go to take off, you know, the Jedi, blah, blah, blah. But I hate to keep gushing about the Bad Batch. Crosshair uses Tech's shoulder as a stabilizer for probably the most insanely good shot that I've seen him do uh, so far. Like, that's impressive. Oh my god, I hate the new interface. I really hate the new interface. Used to be just click, ban, click, ban. Speaking of bot, I said their name. I said their name. I called them forth. Exactly, Plutonia. So yeah, of course, Tech. Exactly, of course, Tech has a stable shoulder. Of course, they've done this enough to that, that the trust is right there, so that he doesn't even have to ask, "Can I use your shoulder to stabilize my shot?" He just lays the sniper, well, the the grappler, uh, right there, takes the shot. Tech has already given the angle, and remember. We've already established that Tech can feed the firing arc to, to, to Crosshair. Chunk manages to grab him. Holy crap. Uh, hands off the thing to him. Off he goes. <laughs> Just kind of crazy, the level of competence here, but it makes sense. These are not only clones, these are mutant clones who are really good at what they do. Anyways. Um, so now we're playing God of War 2, and this is the final time I'm going to bring up that aesthetic thing I just mentioned. I got into a random discussion uh, relatively recently about how each work of fiction, well, no, how several works of fiction, oh, oh I did it! I called another one. Yeah, the, oh my god, I really hate this new interface. I really do. Why is this so hard to ban people now? I'm famous. I'm talking about the Bad Batch. Oh, I see part of the problem. We need to change our tags, don't we? I'm so stupid. There we go. Updated. That's my fault. Um, no, I was still set up for Arcane. That was my bad. Anyways, 
forgive me, aesthetics. Um, how... It's so hard to describe, and people disagree. Something feels like Trek. Something feels like Wars. Something feels like Futurama. Something feels like Farscape. Something feels like Firefly. A lot of uh, individual uh, fictions and fantasies and, and, and franchises have their own particular vibe, right? Um, I know it's shocking who they're... And Wars... A lot of people disagree on Wars' as aesthetic, but... I think Wars is very identifiable on site because there's two things, technically three, that are very, very Wars. First, you have the tech, that very lived-in feel that goes all the way back to the original trilogy. Now, I actually know that the prequel trilogy had the much, much more shiny, chrome kind of aesthetic to it, but even the prequel trilogy and the Clone Wars still lean into that kind of dirty, lived-in tech. The, the used everyday kind of a thing, which is awesome, by the way. Um, and you kind of feel it, right? Yeah, you, it, As Loke says, you know it when you see it. You look at that and you can immediately say, that's Star Wars. The reason this came up is because, and I don't want to get into too much into this, but uh, yeah, very, very much not Star Trek. Um, they recently at uh, Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con's going on, and we've gotten some cool info from that. But one of the things they showcased is a trailer for the new seasons of Lower Decks, Strange New Worlds, and the new Section 31 show that's coming out, uh, starring Michelle Yeo, uh, which I'm probably pronouncing her name extremely badly. And first of all, can I just say that the Strange New Worlds trailer is amazing? But the relevant thing I'm bringing up is the Section 31 trailer doesn't look or feel like Trek at all. And it's easy to define because all you have to do is look at something and divorce it from all context. Turn off the audio, you know, just to pull out your headphones, metaphorically speaking. Look at the thing and say, identify that. What are you looking at? And if you look, and I, I pulled this trick, and if you look at the Section 31 show, it doesn't look like Trek at all. It doesn't feel like Trek at all. It has a completely different vibe. Now, I have no idea if it's going to be a good or bad show. The show's not even out yet. But that just got me thinking about that because this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately since trying to maintain the concept of vibe and tone is something that's very important when it comes to the rewrites. We don't want, you know, Mega Man, Star Wars, and Star Trek to all kind of amalgamate into the same thing, after all. And yeah, the, the trailer, it could also just be a terrible, terrible trailer. It's... The point here being that, by contrast, do you remember the Acolyte trailer? This is a bit ago at this point. Everybody looking at it, even at a glance, could immediately tell that's Star Wars. And uh, there's several examples of that. And, I mean, the show we're watching right now is a very, very good example of it. You look at it and, yeah, that's Star Wars. You tell instantly. It's just got that vibe, that tone, that visual aesthetic to it. So we've got the lived-in tech thing. But the other thing, this almost ties into the Acolyte trailer, is the fantastical and the... The wild is the word I want to use for it. Of all the things that the sequel trilogy has done badly, I think this is one of the few things they've succeeded at, is a lot of the more... Uh, well, not even just the sequel trilogy, I should say all, all five of the new movies, have succeeded at doing this kind of strange, almost mystical look to a lot of things, to make space look a lot more wondrous. That's a good word. A lot more wondrous, right? Um, and managing to to get that kind of fantasy look, let's call it what it is, to it, which makes sense because the third thing, the final thing that really defines Star Wars is the merger of the two. You see this big, wild, fantastical land, and then you see a walker stomp out of it with grime and dust and wear and tear on its metal bolts. That's Star Wars right there. So I bring all this up because I was thinking about this as they were perusing this planet. As, they, as there's there, there's a guy with a grapple trailing behind a giant pterodactyl thing, a flying dinosaur lizard thing, as people in Navi outfits are, are soaring through this wild, insane, like, like half-Venus-looking planet in order to try and track down the general, and figure, you know, Anakin, and figure out what the hell's going on. And it just struck me there, and I wanted to talk about it, because I, I, it's been in my mind lately. <sighs> Forgive me for the uh, for the sidebar. So then we see yeah, the Techno Union. 
Sorry. I'm sorry, that's still one of my favorite memes of the prequel trilogy. I apologize. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The rest of you, don't worry about it. But then Techno Union mentions that they have corporate neutrality. Now, we actually have talked a little bit about that during the, start, the Clone Wars Mini Nation series, because Clone Wars has actually uh, touched on this point before. Long live the banks and all that. Um, but corporate neutrality, by pretty much every dis direction, doesn't apply here. In any direction. Because the Techno Union is an ardent and vocal supporter of the Separatist faction. So... However, it still kind of lines in a little bit. And I was actually just about to bring this up, but Huthor got there before me. Remember that the trade union actually has senators that represent them. Or not the trade union, sorry. Sorry, sorry. The trade federation had senators as far back as episode one that represent them. Really think about that for a moment. So this whole thing just kind of makes me go, huh? Now, we'll see if they do anything with that. But that one line struck me so hard, I had to pause and comment on it. So we find out Wrecker doesn't like heights. Don't blame him. He's a big guy. Uh, he probably would not enjoy going down a ways. Um, I also like... Uh, Wrecker makes a comment. <laughs> Excuse me. Wrecker makes a comment later that, ah, I'll be fine. Just give me some droids to kill. And yeah, it's funny. But I find myself wondering if Wrecker's security blanket, for lack of a better way to put that, is in fact killing droids. I mean, we saw that in Republic Commando. Do you remember that? I don't remember the name of the guy, please forgive me. But the guy who really, really, really liked killing Seps a little bit too much. Just a Was it Sev? I believe you. Uh, I remember him, I just, I'm, I'm not great with names. It's one of the reasons I take notes. So, uh, Hunter and Crosshair both needle Rex about uh, Echo. And you'll notice that, once again, Crosshair is the one to provoke a fight. This is, I think, the fourth time now that we've actually done this. Rex, of course, blows up on him, and there's this whole pseudo fight. Anakin has to get in the way of this one. And I don't really blame Rex for being the way he is, because he is very much Anakin's captain, isn't he? But the fact that he is so blindly insistent about Echo says a lot. Not the least of which that he's walking into this entirely too hopeful. Just, you know. He's also extremely tense right now, and Crosshair is extremely confrontational. So this is just, it's a powder keg. It makes perfect sense that this is going this way. One thing I like is the episode, while it plays it for drama, it doesn't linger there. One of the biggest things I dislike in real life, but also in fiction, is drama. Which, you know what I mean when I say that. Drama is fine. Drama can work. But drama is pretty much universally a bad thing. Uh, yeah, I, when it comes to the review series, we actually have a specific category for that. Fake drama. Here, in this case, it's very understandable why Rex would be what this wound up about it. Why Crosshair would needle him about it. And why Wrecker would get involved with the situation. But notice how they pretty much immediately move past it. After all, they do have a job to do, and they're all just kind of tense. So there's no, you know, I'll never talk to you again kind of a thing. At least not yet. We'll see if uh, see if the next two <laughs> episodes follow through on that. I, d I was just about to comment, though. So then they move forward. They find the spot. I There's a really, really tiny detail. The episode bothers to show just how insanely dense this storm is. How difficult it is to see. And we see, I'm pretty sure it's Crosshair. I, I myself had trouble telling, but I'm pretty sure it's Crosshair. Crosshair. Could have been Hunter. Keeping watch. And then they they like have this physical movement. And then they relax. And then a few seconds later, we, the audience, can now see uh, Anakin and Rex approaching. Nice little touch, because I sure as hell didn't see them on approach. And just, I know, I know, they've got the helmets and all that, but still, little details, right? Little details, that's good stuff. And this is when uh, Crosshair gives this little thing. Yep, it's a lift. So then they go up, fight, fight scene, fight scene, fight scene, fight scene. Uh, tech, I do like these new droids. Nice little styling there, Um... 
uh, type exclamation mark streaminations so you get a full list of which episodes we're covering in which order, Gunters. Um, 187 pounds. Oh my god. Could you imagine deadlifting 187 pounds with one hand? Like, back in my prime, I could have managed that under strain. <laughs> like, that might have been close to my max for one hand. Just yikes. Mm, that's insane. Ah, uh, um. Mm. And, and again, Wrecker's just like, yep. Yep. You know, I would have to have form. I would have to have a balancer. I would have to be braced over here on something. And then be braced like this. And then, okay. Ugh, and then really carefully make sure everything is exactly for the right order. And I could probably only do a few reps before it's like, all right, I'm done, I'm done. Spot me, spot me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, so yeah, the Techno Union has their own droids, which are just there for them. Makes sense. The Techno Union does what they will do and always has. Very cybernetic-y kind of a thing. Um, and... Uh, uh, Tech says something that makes perfect sense, which caught me. I've actually been thinking about this the entire time. Because he keeps talking about how the signal keeps coming and going, and I'm like, of course it is. And then Tech says it out loud. It's like, yeah, it's, it, you can only tra trace the signal when there's a signal. If they're not transmitting, then there's nothing to trace, because there's no signal. I mean, duh, essentially. Especially on a secret facility. Why would you transmit nonstop from a secret facility? So then the Techno Union is like, I'm evil. <laughs> and um, he actually says the line, your friend is dead, his mind is ours. And can I just say I completely called that? Here's the thing. Obviously, I know Star Wars moderately well. Uh, so obviously the Techno Union has a lot of exposure and interaction with cybernetics, which is, by the way, yet another aesthetic that's very common to Star Wars and has been since the beginning. I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, and it's... Uh, the... And it's Grievous, you know, the, the Vader project. Anyways. Um, but the very way that Echo was talking in the first episode was actually the very first thing that made me think that Echo was dead and that they had just hooked his brain up to a jar. Um... And, I mean, if you remember that, right? What, what did Echo say in reaction to Identify Yourself? He just started giving his ID code over and over and over again. That's not the kind of thing a person tends to say, right? So, okay. So then we actually see Echo. And if you're paying attention, Echo is way, way more tech than he is person at this point. Uh, he is well over the 50% marker. Uh, his entire bottom half, for example. He's, he's, he's like one step away from Maul at this point. I, uh, yeah. And once again, uh, he looked, he looks so terrible. I mean, after all, that makes perfect sense. They've eff effectively turned him into an adjutant from StarCraft. Ra I know I didn't know that coming before you ask. Um, and he's, yeah, he's, he's skinny, he's, he's malcontent, he's just hooked up to the thing. Of course he is. They don't care about his well-being. This is not designed to be a way to keep him alive and functional as a person. They pretty much just wanted his brain functional. And that means they probably need his spinal cord functional, and at least some of his autonomic systems, like his heart and his lungs. But the rest of it, eh. I mean, even Grievous needed his heart and lungs, if you remember. So, yeah, he's, he, he, oh man, he looks terrible. Uh, and the fact that he is still thinking about the escape, the fact that he is still thinking about the events at the Citadel, that says a lot. Because it quietly implies that Echo mentally, like from his perspective, from his awareness, he's just been kind of stuck there, right? Whatever sentience or consciousness he has has been stuck on the Citadel for however long it's been in universe. I don't know if that's true. That's just the first impression I got from the way he was talking. It isn't until he actually processes that Rex is right here in front of him. Um, that Rex is right there. It's just... Oh, you came back for me. You came back for me. And Rex's reaction... 
is the hesitance. He just, he, it's just so brief. It's like less than a second, but he hesitates. Yes, yes, I came back for you. I came back for you. And just, oof, you know? And this says so much. As I've said before, this is, this is a Rex arc. At least so far, the first two episodes are very, very clearly focused on Rex. The clone, the officer, the veteran, who has probably been beating himself up for, again, however long it's been since the Citadel incident in-universe, about the fact that he left Echo behind. You can tell immediately that this has absolutely hung on him this entire time. Unfortunately, this is episode two of four. So I have no idea how much more bad this is going to get in the immediacy. So, what do you think on this one? Oh, I actually meant to talk about something. I apologize. Uh, I must have skipped right over my notes and I had a whole thing here. Um, there's, so forgive me, forgive me, I'm going to go ahead and talk about this. Earlier in the episode, there's a better showcasing of how good the Bad Batch are, in my opinion. It's brief, but there's this tidbit where rather than fighting a bunch of droids that you can just kill all willy-nilly, they're fighting a bunch of natives who are there trying very hard not to kill under orders. That's a lot harder to do than just walking in guns blazing. So, that's its own thing. <laughs> um, and on top of that, they also are in the middle of a combat situ situation with people who probably don't understand they're trying not to kill them. And then they do three things very smartly in quick succession. First, I was expecting these to be space cavemen, but they're not. They have technology, civilization, hierarchy, communication. In fact, they're even fully cognizant of the fact that the Clone Wars exists and are desperately trying to keep out of the Clone Wars as much as possible. Nice touch. Second, yeah, they just like to ride space bats. That's it. I wouldn't mind riding a space bat. Second point, they treat them respectfully. They actually, the, 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 the whole way they convince them to help them in this situation is Anakin's like, hey, look, look, look. We, and then Rex comes forward and says, all we want is to rescue our, our, our fallen soldier. Once that, we're out. We'll leave you alone. And it, it's not just respectful, it's getting right to the heart of the matter and giving them exactly what they want. And the third thing, I like the translator thing. I like the tidbit of how they actually have to have a translator on hand. This is the kind of thing that I've beat my head against the wall about a lot when it comes to our trek is because you kind of need the universal translator. Otherwise, every episode grinds to a halt as we have a then three weeks pass as we figure out their grammatical structure. Okay, now we can talk, right? It doesn't work for pacing and t t tempo. But in this case, having someone with a translator on hand that he can run through and then try to read for them works, right? And they don't lean on it too hard, and so it doesn't become padding, but it does make perfect sense that the translator is like the thing to help, help, help out. And keep in mind, Anakin was right. They've been communicating this whole time without words, because they've gone very far out of the way to not kill these people. They could have. They won this particular conflict, and they did it without hurting anybody, and that's impressive. So, oh yeah, Tech is probably doing a really really terrible job of communicating it. But, you know, the intent is getting across. Good stuff. Sorry. I want to comment on this scene very quickly. So I see several people saying orange and several people are saying red. Uh, there's also a boulder, which nearly killed Anakin. That would have been funny. Palpatine, my, my emperor Palpatine, I have a report. Yes, what is it? I'm afraid your, your vaunted apprentice has been killed by a boulder. What? Yes, my lord. I'm afraid that uh, some giant mutant clone rolled a boulder down a hill and it crushed Anakin to death. <sighs> Anyways. <clears throat> and Palpatine can't even process, right? He's just he's just staring at him like... Trying to wrap his brain about how absolutely insane that is. <laughs> And then Palpatine finds the boulder. Like, it cuts to Palpatine on the planet. And he puts a hand on the boulder. Yes, you will be my greatest apprentice of all. 
And then and then we have let's just keep going with this. And then there's this whole thing where Palpatine is like riding the boulder. Like he's doing that backwards walk thing on the boulder as it's running over all the rebels. We cut to the Tantive Four at the beginning of a new, a new Hope, and it's like you know they're they're all like oh, choo, 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 and all the stormtroopers knock out all the rebels, and then you hear and this boulder like slams into the door, pauses, rolls up, slams into the door. Hang on, there we go. Smashes through, smashes through the frame. Boulder rolls. Boulder rolls up to Leia. <laughs> Darth Creditus. <laughs> yeah, we've just we're just doing a, the Family Guy Star Wars show now. <laughs> oh God, no, that's it. That's how we tie it all in. This is the Boulder from Indiana Jones. That's it. That's what it is. <laughs> I like this episode quite a lot. But, in the interest of honesty, I actually think this is once again an orange. This is a damn good episode. This is this is good stuff. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't truly hit the heights of what I think it can, um, and it certainly doesn't have the extra oomph for the purple, for the, for the extremely rare purple. But it's still a damn good episode, and and that's orange. That's what orange means. Um, oh God, I know to quote it. You can even defeat them for experience. <laughs> Or maybe I'm thinking of one of the other Souls likes. I'm feeling orange. I'm feeling orange. So it's two oranges so far. Really solid opening. And once again, I am super invested in finding out what happens next. <laughs> Boulder. <laughs> That's in my head now. That's in my... I'm about to share it with my friends tonight. I'm going to have to be like, all right, so hear me out. Okay. <laughs> this is the elevator pitch. Palpatine takes a boulder as his new apprentice. I'm gonna go watch the next episode. Let's see in a bit.